right, thank you very much. So uh, we'll be talking about, the title is a little misleading in full disclosure. When Corey asked me to give this talk, I was very honored and pleased to give it, but my first question was, um, what do you really want me to talk about? Because there's not all that much to talk about beyond PET that wouldn't have you guys glazing over and asleep within two to three minutes. So, um, so there's gonna be a fair amount of PET there, but trying to give you an idea of, of where we are and, and what, what's going on. So current status of functional imaging in lung cancer, some of the challenges posed by specific therapies, and then emerging modalities and techniques. All right, so, so when he first said beyond FDG PET CT, it was like a lot of silence. And for most cancers, there would be a huge list. So there's a huge amount of research going on in um, prostate cancer with all kinds of PSMA-targeted imaging and different things, um, in breast cancer. And a lot of cancers, there's a lot going on, but relatively less so in lung cancer. And a lot of that is because FDG PET-CT just works pretty darn well in lung cancer. And so it's pretty hard to improve on the diagnostic accuracy. Although there is the potential, and I'm gonna show you a few examples, to ask more specific questions than just is there disease and where is the disease. But a lot of times we get hung up on that with imaging. And then the, the bigger issue is that when we're trying to image large populations of patients, so in breast cancer, it's sort of ubiquitous. You wanna know what, what is their hormone receptor status, and so you can image a lot of patients and consider that a target. Same thing with prostate cancer and PSMA. With lung cancer, there are targets, but they're less ubiquitous, and so it's a little harder to um, focus imaging, although many of those subset of lung cancers are still higher in prevalence than many of these other cancers' entire pool, but when we start to divide it up, there's, it, it gets to be a little harder to get funding and support for a lot of these investigations. So as far as looking at pulmonary nodules, suspected lung cancer, so these are patients who have not yet been diagnosed but may have been picked up on screening or incidentally um, as having a nodule. And so if there's a solid nodule of at least eight millimeters, I think there's very good data that those patients really should get an FDG PET-CT. Um, th there's something that if the mass is a lot bigger than that, so if you have a, a huge six, eight centimeter mass, do you just know that it's cancer and go on, but very often you can still get important information about the overall stage of the patient and um, build your treatment strategy. And so FDG PET in those patients with at least eight millimeters is important. Um, the guidelines, while they're clear on getting an FDG PET, so if you see these Fleischner criteria, uh, Fleischner Society guidelines on CT management of pulmonary nodules, they say get a PET, but they don't really say what to do after the PET. So if the PET is positive, clearly you're gonna go down the path of a biopsy and, and treating that patient, but it's, it's a little less clear when the PET is negative and the nodule is big enough that the PET should characterize it what to do. And so for the most part, we sort of defer to continuing to follow those patients with imaging, but feeling reassured that there's nothing that you need to do aggressively generally. You have time in those patients to see because if, even if it is a malignancy, it's likely to be a more indolent one where um, there's, there's no magic, uh, major rush. For subsolid nodules, these previously ground glass nodules or semi-solid, the yield of FDG PET-CT is much lower. And so if it's negative, you can feel reassured that yeah, it's okay, we're gonna recommend imaging in six months and that's okay to wait six months because a lot of patients get anxious about that. Um, but it's otherwise rarely helpful. So hard to really recommend that strongly. But if the solid component's at least eight millimeters, and especially if it's growing, you can treat that like a solid eight millimeter nodule. So it is very reasonable to, um, to image those patients. Um, the one last thing I'll mention is this eight millimeter, it's not a magic number. So take into consideration what kind of uh, equipment you have. So if you are lucky to be in a center that has really state-of-the-art modern PET-CT equipment, um, you can push that limit a little bit maybe. Um, if you're in a place where they have a camera that was, you know, it's gonna go straight from the radiology department to a museum, then sometimes eight millimeters is, you just can't see anything about it because it, it's like someone rubbed Vaseline on the screen. So um, nuclear medicine, most of our current trainees have never heard it called unclear medicine. Um, for those of you who have been around a little bit longer, uh, you probably remember that moniker. We've largely shed that, but um, there are some relics. So 
take that into consideration. The other thing is if you have some, a patient who's got big nodes, sometimes we see these patients that have a lot of adenopathy. They look like they've got advanced cancer, but they've only got like a six millimeter lung nodule. Um, and sometimes we see that, particularly in small cell where um, their pulmonary parenchymal disease is really underwhelming, but they've got disease everywhere else. Um, some of those patients, if you have a patient where despite their chest CT being fairly underwhelming, you really think that they've got something going on, occasionally we'll do a PET CT in a patient with a small nodule just because we think they may have distant disease, but that's a rare situation. All right. So as far as splitting up small cell and non-small cell, um, in both of them, uh, FDG PET CT is recommended if, uh, for staging. For the, per the NCCN guidelines, if limited stage is suspected, they certainly recommend it. They say optional if you know that the patient has extensive stage, which is very reasonable. They recommend imaging the skull base to the thighs. Um, they do say that bone scan is recommended if PET is unavailable. Um, I say yuck. I really think there is virtually no reason to do a bone scan in a patient with lung cancer. Um, it's except I think the only situation is some of these patients with really indolent adenocarcinoma that behaves a lot like adenocarcinoma of the breast, where they have diffuse sclerotic lesions that have very low metabolic rate. Their PET has an SUV of two. Um, in those cases, bone scan can be helpful, and in fact, bone targeted therapy can be helpful, but those patients are few and far between. Um, about 20% of patients are upstaged by PET, 8% downstaged by PET, so it really it can be helpful, but not recommended for routine imaging. For non small cell lung cancer, the NCCN guidelines say either skull based to thighs or head to toe. I disagree with that recommendation. I think there's a very, very low yield of imaging head to toe. And the big thing there is brain metastasis is very common in non-small cell and small cell lung cancer. PET-CT with FDG is not very good at finding the um, brain metastases. So don't be reassured. Don't say, oh, I'm just going to image them head to toe, and then I cannot bother to get a brain MR um, because the PET was negative there. It shouldn't reassure you. We do sometimes pick up brain metastases incidentally in these patients. Um, the positive predictive value is high, but the negative predictive value is very, very poor. So I don't, and then you're almost never gonna find something in the extremities if, you, if the patient's asymptomatic. So really I think skull based to thighs is very reasonable. They make a very odd statement if you read the NCCN guidelines that if PET-CT is positive in the mediastinum needs pathologic confirmation, I think they've got it backwards. The positive predictive value of FDG PET-CT is quite high in the mediastinum. It's the patients with a negative PET-CT that really need pathologic confirmation because you have a, a relatively low negative predictive value. Um, they do point out not recommended for routine imaging, but useful if symptomatic or CT evidence of recurrence, which um, both are quite reasonable. One comment on surveillance imaging. So, they go through pains, a lot of guidelines to say you shouldn't use PET-CT for surveillance. Um, but then they say, oh, but we've been doing CT every three months for our, our entire career, so we should keep doing that. But there's really no good data on the effect of surveillance imaging pretty much across the board in cancers. Um, so there's not any more data for CT than MR or PET-CT. You heard a little bit about the NLST trial. Um, the ch chair of Akron, had to actually testify to Congress on why they spent over $300 million doing that trial. It's unlikely we'll ever get a good, really well-controlled trial for screening imaging in patients with cancer um, in any setting. So we just have to use good clinical judgment. So just doing reflex imaging is probably not very useful, but um, it really, if, if there's clinical suspicion, then uh, I don't think you should hesitate to do imaging. After external beam radiation, FDG PET-CT can be quite challenging. The radiation-induced inflammation can evolve over months and even years. Um, it can become more intense over interval scans, so you can have, you get a scan at three months, there's something there, and then you get a scan at six months and it's worse and you're thinking it's terrible, um, but it's, it can just be normal. We can't differentiate just sort of benign inflammation from radiation pneumonitis that can be life-threatening. Um, and so you shouldn't assume that the patient's progressing. And it used to be when they did nonconformal radiation, they just had these 
ports with nice straight lines. It used to be pretty easy to know what was radiation because tumors don't generally grow with perfectly straight lines. Um, but now with highly conformal radiation, it's a lot harder to tell the difference between um, radiation-induced inflammation from tumor from a combination of both. And if there are any radiation oncologists in the audience, this is my plea to please don't keep your plans a secret. Um, a lot of times we could help to differentiate. If we knew that something on the PET scan is outside the radiation treatment fields, then we're a lot more certain, but trying to get those plans can be challenging. So um, if you are a radiation oncologist, uh, try to send those plans to the me medical record. It's very feasible. The one thing that I'll mention is a lot of these patients have distant failure, and FDG PET-CT is still going to be very straightforward in detecting those distant failures. So if you think a patient may be failing, don't hesitate to image them because you know that it's going to be complicated looking at their radiation field. You can still gain a lot of information about that. And so here's just an example of a patient. The top row is um, prior to treatment. This was a stage three non-small cell lung cancer with positive mediastinal and hyalur nodes. And then after treatment, you can tell that that um, where there was clearly a mass here, there's just sort of this heterogeneous stuff. It's outside the confines of the, where the mass was. It has this sort of less focal, less blob-like uptake. The nodes have completely disappeared. And so you can be reassured that this patient is, it's probably all post-radiation, but it can be hard to be certain until, as in this case, this patient is still alive. I think this is now eight years after I first made this image, um, and the patient's doing quite well, and I feel better about it every time I show it. After immunotherapy, though, this is now um, the bane of our existence in imaging. It's an amazing thing thing that's coming out nowadays with immunotherapy and the potential to have just these dramatic, amazing responses. But trying to figure out who's responding and who's not can be really, really complicated. Um, if you look in this, so these patients can have what's called pseudoprogression. I've seen patients go from a pretty underwhelming scan to a scan that, I mean, there's new lesions, the existing lesions are huge, they're blazing hot, and then they just disappear. Um, and there's really no reliable way to differentiate pseudoprogression from progression. And so clinical judgment is critical. So I know we've seen patients where um, Corey sends the patient, we say this patient's progressing horribly. He says, well, it doesn't make sense. The patient looks great. And so I'm going to continue treatment. And we say, all right, well, we'll see. And then sure enough, the patient, three months later, their scan is, looks great. So um, don't stop the therapy prematurely. If, cl if your clinical judgment is the patient's doing well, know that um, patients who are responding can have a scan that looks absolutely horrible. And here's just an example from, we see a lot more of these with, in melanoma with uh, just immunotherapy's been around a lot longer, but we're seeing these as well in lung cancer. Um, but this is one where it went from uh, a few areas of disease to disease everywhere to disease almost gone, all within a three month period. So, a uh, colleague of mine, Mike Farwell, is doing a lot of work on immunotherapy and trying to image immunotherapy. And so there's a lot of examples. So, for example, you can um, label the antibodies themselves with a PET emitter and try to look for target expression to try to figure out which are the patients who are more likely to respond. Um, that's very early, and we're, we're waiting eagerly to see whether we can enrich the population so that the response rates can be increased. Um, and so you can sort of understand the kinetics of, so you can see that this radio-labeled antibody is targeting the patient's disease over time. And so this patient, the antibody's certainly getting there and, and hopefully will engender an immune response. Um, this is something that was presented at ASCO that's very interesting. So this just shows these pseudo-progressions that can happen. And the really interesting thing is that in some of these patients, if you look at the axis here, it can happen pretty late. Um, these antibodies have a very long circulating time. They can hang around a long time. We actually saw, interestingly, we've seen patients where they have um, an immune checkpoint antibody on board, and then months, months later, you biopsy a new lesion, and then all of a sudden they have this florid immune response and all their disease goes away everywhere. And so the immune system's funny, and sometimes it just takes a nudge, 
or you start some other treatment and you get some necrosis and all of a sudden the immune system comes in there to try to clean it up and you get the antigen presenting cells and all of a sudden that system that can go off and, and you can see these things happening months later, months after giving a patient antibody immunotherapy that you thought didn't work while it was just waiting for the right kick. So keep that in mind. We've been really interested for a long time in trying to image proliferation directly. And so that can be done with FLT, which is a radio-labeled thymidine. So because thymidine is used solely in DNA and not protein synthesis, um, you can look at proliferative rate. And so you can more specifically look at the effects of antiproliferative ter therapy. There was just a publication very recently that was really fascinating in that we basically the results are the exact opposite of what you might initially expect is that response on FLT actually predicted poor outcome um, both in progression-free survival and overall survival. And so here's an example. Um, this patient, you can see their FDG PET didn't really respond very well, but the um, FLT signal went away very quickly. And so their, their hypothesis was that in patients whose FLT signal shuts down very quickly in the face of cytotoxic therapy, perhaps that tumor can escape treatment by just sort of becoming quiescent, and then immediately when you stop therapy, uh, the tumor comes raging back. So it was, it was a surprising finding, but an interesting one, sort of challenging our ideas of um, how to look for, uh, for response. So some of the new imaging therapies looking for trying to track immunotherapies. Um, people have looked at, so I showed you some of the, um, the one antibody. People have looked at trying to track uh, the immune cells with CD8 labeled an anti-CD8 antibodies trying to just go back to old school indium-111 labeled white blood cells or PET uh, correlates of those, trying to image immune activation, so perhaps looking using FDG PET but much more quickly, so three days or a week after to try to image at such an early point that you know it can't be real progression. Um, looking at granzyme B, which is uh, a marker of immune activation. And then with some of the more... Um, genetically engineered treatments like CAR T cells, where you actually have modified cells that you're re-injecting into the patient, you can potentially include reporter genes into those cells when you transfect them and, um, and then use those to target. And so people have done that a lot with HSV, thymidine kinase, which has been of limited success. And so there are a lot of tools and, and there's a lot of work ongoing. So there's a huge amount with that. And so hopefully we'll see that increase over time. And just some very, very, very early work with trying to image CAR T cells in vivo after uh, reinfusion. And interestingly, with things like CAR T cells, um, where they're stably transfected and they can pass these reporter genes along through multiple generations, you can potentially have a persistent uh, signal that you can follow for uh, years in some patients. Um, PET MRI is a, a newer modality that's come along. Uh, it's basically you take a PET scanner and an MR scanner and add a million dollars and you get a PET MR. Um, the earliest devices were basically compromised MRs with compromised PETs. The newer generation devices are state-of-the-art PET scanners and state-of-the-art MRs. Um, they're quite expensive. The synergy with PET and MR um, is less clear than with PET and CT. PET and CT go together really well because one is purely functional, one is purely anatomic, essentially, and um, the speed with which they can, you can get things done are, is very useful. With PET MR, it's a little bit unclear, and in the chest, respiratory motion is quite difficult. So um, if you have one of these in your center, um, great. Hopefully you have things to use it for, but um, for the most part, the future is very uncertain in general and more so in lung cancer. What's more relevant is these newest generation of PET CTs termed digital PET CTs because they've gotten rid of the old vacuum tube photomultiplier tubes and use what's basically almost like uh, the chip from a digital camera to help with the signal. And these have very high sensitivity. Um, 
so you can get better images in a shorter period of time. They are available today. Advantages are incremental, but important. But the important thing to mention is, so when this is from, this is not from a digital scanner, this is just from a, a good time of flight scanner, where you see the signal from a four millimeter lymph node. So now we're starting to see things that are, we couldn't see before. And so there's a learning curve to figuring out which of those things are actually cancer. So, so the fear is that when you improve the sensitivity of your device, you're going to destroy your specificity. And so there is a learning curve. So if you get a new device at your center, don't um, think that your patients are suddenly a lot sicker than they were right before it was installed. Um, so I think FDG PET-CT, the future is now. It still works really well for lung cancer, but immunotherapy response assessment uh, poses some significant challenges. There is potential for incremental hardware improvement and new tracers. Unfortunately, less active research in lung cancer than in other cancers, though I think the immunotherapy research will be very relevant. Um, but if you have relevant questions, ask your imagers, and potentially imaging can help to answer them. So I will stop there.